All right, what is going on, guys? It's Do One Two Three Four Five bringing you guys a very different kind of video. Obviously, uh, this is me. It's it's in person. You guys are actually getting to see me. Uh, we're still kind of in the time of COVID. If you guys are watching this off in the future or whatever, if I've made more in person videos or whatnot, but I'm here. This is me. Uh, today we're doing a review. Um, I know I've done a couple of those on the channel for various things, but uh, today we're going to be doing a review of the Dungeons & Dragons Stranger Things starter set, which is um, one of four starter sets that they've released, that Wizards of the Coast has released. Um, and the first one that I actually played through, the introduction for me and my players to D&D 5e. Uh, we chose to play this one just because it was the shortest, and it, it, it's just the one that we chose. Um, a quick disclaimer, my box did come broken. I don't know if y'all can see that. There you go. Um, right in here. We have re we have uh, since taped it, but that was just, uh, you know, packaging errors and whatnot. So all of that was uh, not Wizards of the Coast fault, or it might have been Amazon's fault. I don't know. It might have been UPS's, S USPS's. I don't know. Um, but yeah, let's just hop right into the review. So in terms of Physically, um, I think the box out looks really cool. It's definitely got that like retro 1970s, 1980s, like original first edition D&D kind of packaging going to it. The box is meant to look like it's kind of aged and beaten up. They chose a very vibrant red, which I think is a really good idea. Um, and it kind of draws reminiscence on the original starter set, which I think was a red box. It might've been a blue box and later a red box. Um, but they're kind of drawing on that original audience there of the um, of people that got the starter set back in the day. Um, and so, you know, it says everything you need to embark on your Stranger Things adventure. And then the back obviously delves into what's in there. I don't think there's a need to read it right now, but uh, it, it delves on into everything that's in there. Uh, the box is a little bit deceiving. Um, if you guys can see, we're going to go ahead and open this up here. You can see just how much of the box is is for these little miniatures right here. It is quite the quite the the deceiving size of the box there um, for the content you're getting, as is with most 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 Dungeons and Dragons content. Um, you're mainly dealing and paying for paper. It's books and articles, and I mean, other than like you know minis and like you know dice or something like that most of what you're dealing with is just kind of paper so that's why they tend to come in on the cheaper side of things um but you know if you see other starter sets i have them upstairs like like the call of cthulhu starter set if, or stuff like that i mean they're very more minuscule boxes because they recognize that all you're getting are like these you know little books of paper little like magazines essentially um but so that's one thing that i noted is that they they certainly give you a lot of room for the minis there uh, now the next thing on my physical list here is of course the minis themselves um they are made of some pretty flimsy plastic uh i'll get this closer to the camera for you guys it is very very bendable um you could easily bend him uh, off of his little pedestal there um, I don't know if this is, I have my battle mat right here. So he does take up a standard, uh, I think it's a one inch square on the grid. I have my battle mat right there on the table. So he does fit that, but uh, if y'all look at it and we compare our two minis here, because uh, it does come with an unpainted one, then you can really start to recognize that, let's see if it'll focus. It's probably not going to, it's wanting to focus on my face. And not the mini. Focus on the mini. It does not want to focus on the mini. Trying to get it to focus on the mini. It's probably not going to focus. Well, y'all can take my word for it. The paint job is not that good. Um, it's pretty trash. And they look almost identical to the unpainted and painted version. Uh, now, the one upside to that is that you do get the unpainted version so if you have paints and you're into mini painting and that sort of thing then by all means you can paint yourself up a demogorgon which is an exclusive creature well there's a demogorgon in D&D, but it's like this big monkey abyssal thing it does not look like the stranger things demogorgon so you do get that 
which I find kind of interesting considering that the adventure is themed around the Thessal Hydra, not uh, the Demogorgon. But yeah, uh, other than that, the last thing I have on the physical is the dice set. And for those of you wondering, and I thought I had both of them here, but I guess I have some extra put away in my like extra dice bag because I have a lot of dice. Let's let's be honest. I think we all expected that. Um, this is the dice set. So I don't know how to demonstrate it to you guys. We've got just these bland blue die. I mean, they're not too bland. They're you can tell they're kind of cheaply made, but they, you know they are what you expect. The big kicker here is that it only comes with one d twenty. And if any of you are familiar with 5th edition, uh, you know that advantage and disadvantage play a big role in the system. Um, so only having 1d20, while it's not, you know, impossible that you could, wow, I just rolled that 20. Uh, it's not impossible you can roll twice. It just, it's not the same feel as picking up two different dice, which some of their later starter sets, i.e. the Essentials Kit and the Rick and Morty starter set, which I will be covering reviews on the channel too, uh, they do come with two d20s. They also come with a d10 and a... 10s d10 aka percentile dice uh this does not it just comes with your standard d10 okay uh, good job nathaniel but yeah so you've got you know your zero and then one through nine and then lastly it also only comes with one d6 which is also a little upset you know as uh, if anyone has played fifth edition you know that there are a plethora of d6s to be rolled and only one of them can lead to a lot of rolling now obviously a lot of this can be fixed with, you know, dice rolling apps and, and, and whatnot. So it's by no means like the end of the world that you only get one of these. Um, but it is something of note that I went ahead and jotted down in my notes for the video. Um, so other than that, that's most of the physical stuff that came in the set, uh, other than the books which we're about to get into. So if we'll go ahead and remove the, uh, you know, like two inch thick, you know, thing there that's just for this little, little set of minis here, we get into the actual contents of the starter set. All right, and so I broke this down into two sections. I broke it down into the starter set rule book, which is this big magazine lad right here. He is, he is chilling. Um, and then the adventure book which is the Hunt for the Thessal Hydra, which we'll get into for a second. We're going to do the rule, rule book first. And then added on to this, added on to the adventure book, I went ahead and threw in the pre-generated characters with it. So we'll be reviewing those together. So let us go ahead and get into the rule book here. So this is the starter set rule book. If you guys can see that, it's, it, I mean, it's your standard like magazine rule book. If you've seen, uh, any of the starter sets or it, I mean yes it's thick for like if you're thinking like board games but for those of you who don't know that Dungeons and Dragons is a tabletop RPG and it needs more rules than like your standard board game so this is is pretty standard in fact if you've seen the player's handbook um which I'll probably do a video on at some point as well I'm in the process of finishing it there are 90 something pages of spells so that's taking me a second but if uh if you guys didn't know, I mean, this is kind of necessary. It's a little bit bloated compared to, say, like, the D&D starter set rulebook, which I just happen to have here because I'm at my setup and my, my group is playing through this campaign right now. Um, but if you compare it to something like that, it's a little bit thicker because the way they organized it, and this is kind of getting into the, the adventure module a little bit, is that they put the monsters and magic items into this to kind of keep the theme of the adventure book being the pure adventure book. Whereas normally the monster stat blocks and the magic item descriptions and all that stuff is gonna be thrown in to that adventure module. So that's why it is a little on the thick side. Um, all in all, I almost just dropped everything if y'all saw the fear on my face. Uh, <laughs> all in all, it is your pretty standard rule book. Um, I went ahead and read through it all just to see if there was anything in there that spiced it up. As far as I could tell, it is basically word for word copied from uh, from the starter set rule book. Uh, the only thing different that might be a little bit different is the spell list. 
which I don't know if you guys can see that. It might even be upside down for you guys now that I think about it. With the way that videos work, I don't really know. Um, but that's the spell list. Uh, one thing about this, and this is also getting to the characters, is that they included um, some variety when it came to your character type. So your standard starter sets always came with like the generic four. You have your wizard, you have your cleric, you have your fighter, and then you have your rogue. Um, and if it had more than four characters, they'd either throw in like an extra fighter or an extra rogue. This set is very specific in its characters and kind of a bad idea for us to play at first, to be completely honest with you. I mean, obviously I knew the rules well enough that I was comfortable to go forward with it. But if you didn't, it can be a little confusing because you do start out at third level because some of the monsters and stuff, which we'll get into in a second, are, uh, needless to say, a little difficult at times. Uh, and, and you're definitely going to want those, those higher levels, which they're not high levels, but for starters that, I mean, you're starting out at like mid tier starter set right there. Um, so that's the only thing a little bit different is you have spells like Hunter's Mark, for example, or Long Strider, which are ranger spells. Those don't show up in the starter set rule book because there's not rangers as an option. Um, so yeah, just, just that kind of difference. Other than that, it's very standard. Uh, one of the big kickers for me was uh, just how bland it feels. Let me go ahead and give you an example here real quick. Let me just open up to, oh, let's just say a section on the magic items or something like that. Like, or, or here, here's a good example of, well, maybe not. Like, if you just take a look at the standard page here, this is very rules heavy. I don't know if y'all can read that. You don't really need to. But this is extremely rules heavy. It is just blocks and blocks of information. If I took these pages and like photocopied them and turned it into like a 300, 400 page book, you'd think you're reading like a college textbook or something like that. The only art that's in here at all are just random pictures that are in the chapters of the book or the appendices. I don't know this one. It's chapter two. So the chapters of the book. And they're just random pictures from the Stranger Things show. Now this might, you know, entice some of you guys. Uh, personally, I've never been a Stranger Things fan, uh, never watched the show, so I'm not saying it's bad, I'm just saying I haven't given it a shot uh, just yet anyways. Uh, but it's just random pictures from the show and that's it. They don't tie into the, the chapter. And then there's just no art on all the other pages. It's just content and tables. Uh, and for some people that's, you know, that's perfectly fine. There's another generic piece of art. Um, but for some people that's, that, you know, that's fine and all, and I'm not saying that I'm completely opposed to that, but if I just went to like the magic item section in our uh, most recent one here, I mean, and, and y'all don't need to like see that because if my players are watching you, I better not, better not read the, read the magic items I'm watching you. I'm watching you, I'm joking. Uh, but I mean, look at all that art just thrown in at the bottom of it. I mean, you've got gauntlets and wands and armor and swords and scrolls and, and, and rings and potions. Just kind of there. Now, that's not to say that they don't have some pages that seem like just pure info. Because uh, they do. Uh, but then you hit, like, the monster area, right? Once again, no reading stat blocks, guys. But if I hold it far enough away, you see that there's art of monsters and stuff like that through the monster section. Granted, this is in the adventure book because that's how they did it for this starter set. Um, but if we look at the monster section of the rule book, there's nothing. There's nothing giving the DM inspiration. In fact, one of the monsters there, that like gray blobby humanoid thing. Sorry, I got a notification. Got to clear that. Um, one of like the, the gray blobby humanoid thing. It's called a doppelganger, right? His stat block is right here in this book too. But they, they didn't feel the need to, like, copy over any art. So if my players ask me what something looks like, sure, the DM is expected to describe it and expected to kind of set the scene for the players. But it never hurts to show a little bit of art. And, I mean, I've just got nothing here. Absolutely nothing. There's, I mean, this is all of the monster stat blocks, and there is no art there at all. It, it's truly a disappointment, and it really docks from the from the experience because I like to be able to say, oh yeah, well I mean you see this you know big grueling ogre, it's standing over you, it's it's moss dripping and you know and all that good stuff. I can describe it, okay? I get that that's my job, but at the end of the day, it's always nice to be like, and here's a picture 
in case my description wasn't good enough, uh, because it, it very well might not be to some players. They might get a little confused on that. So some people just prefer to visualize things. Um, so I definitely think that's a bit of a dox right there. Uh, other than that, in terms of straight general rules, right, just straight rules, it's solid. It has all the rules in it. You can sit down, read all 40-something pages of it. You'll probably be bored by the end, but you will understand how the game works. So in that sense, it works as a rule book. Um, let's see. Monster stat blocks and magic items are included in it instead of uh, the adventure module. And quick spoiler here, just in case you plan on running this for, um, or playing in this, I guess if you're running it, then this is not a spoiler. Hopefully you either already know this because you've read it, or you will know it soon. Um, but quick spoiler, one of the monsters uh, that you will run into is a giant frog. There is no giant frog stat block in here. Now, that's not to say it's hard to look up and find the stat block, because you can, and that's exactly what I did for my campaign, or not campaign, but playthrough of the adventure. I just went to Google and searched giant frog, um, D&D 5e, and it popped up. Um, but, you know, if you're playing, if you took this to somewhere where you might not have Wi-Fi, if you, it's just... You can't not have the stuff in the adventure, so that's definitely another dock right here, that there's not the giant frog. It's just, it's not in here. And they, they add extra monsters in here that aren't in the adventure to give you a level, very small, admittingly, but a level of replayability where the DM could craft their own campaign or whatever based on, you know, using new monsters from the thing, even though you don't have pictures. Giant frog's not in there. Uh, other than that, we'll set this aside until we get back to the overall score at the end. Alrighty, so moving on to the uh, meat and potatoes, if you will, of the box set here. The character sheets and, of course, the adventure book, Hunt for the Thessal Hydra, uh, which, of course, is themed very much like it's supposed to be an old textbook, um, or not textbook, but like notebook, um, if you will, that, and it's very much themed that way, uh, and it's got a, a special font uh, to where it looks like it was written by the kid in the show. I think his name is Will. Um, correct me about that if I'm wrong, but I think his name is Will. Uh, and he, I mean, he even writes himself, like, the notes are as if they're written to himself. It's very, uh, you know, characterized here, but it's not, there, there's some serious flaws with it. So let's just go ahead and uh, jump into it. Um, first of all, we'll start out with a few positive things. I'll just clear out the rest of, uh, the rest of this here for you guys. Um, all right, that's surprisingly thick, but uh, so we have here... Our character sheets. Now I'm by no means going to break down all of these, but just for reference, we are given a level three ranger, a level three wizard, um, I think I know this, a level three cleric, a level three bard, and then a level three paladin. Um, so like I said, you certainly do get to experience some of those lesser known, lesser experienced classes of D&D while still keeping it kind of easy. You know, they're not trying to force you to play a warlock or a monk, although monks aren't actually that difficult to play. Warlocks could be a little difficult, um, or an artificer, which has just been more recently introduced, but was out by the time that this set came out. Um, they're not trying to get you to play stuff like that, and that's obviously okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, so certainly one of the best things about this kit, the variety of characters. Uh, now, I do know that later on, some kits do include rules for character creation. This kit does not. Um, it does not include rules for character creation. So if that's something you're interested in, um, the only starter set that will include those rules for you is the Essentials Kit starter set. All right, so moving into the actual adventures itself. Um, as I previously showed you guys, it is, of course, laid out like like an actual notebook. I don't know if y'all can see 
the actual like lines like it's a, a school textbook notebook kind of thing um, and it's got that font of incredibly good handwriting for like a 14 12 year old kid or whatever um, but I digress maybe I'm just on the worst side of the handwriting um, uh, but it's very characteristic and I do think that's a cool thing it has going for it um, but I think it's also a marketing decision because if you've seen any official Wizards of the Coast adventure module, I'm, I'm hopping right back into Lost Minds of Fandelver here because it's always a good one uh, to roll with. This is what our pages look like normally. I mean, there are plenty of art, plenty of things to keep you interested, but at the same time, a lot of content there. All 60 pages or whatever of this adventure feel like I'm getting 60 pages of adventure. This, on the contrary, is very different. It comes in at a whopping... Well, it doesn't even have page numbers on it, I don't think. Well, y'all can look at that. It comes in at maybe, maybe, what, 20-something pages? And, I mean, I kid you not, some of the pages only have that much text on it. So if this was formatted in the standard Wizards of the Coast, like multiple textbook-style paragraphs and, and columns on each page... I'd be willing to say the whole thing would take up maybe about like seven pages, which is just not enough for a, um, a starter set at its price, which by the way is MSRP $25, $24.99. And the current selling price when I took my notes on it last night on Amazon was $16.88. So um, that's definitely a big point. Now into the actual adventure itself, uh, because now we are breaking down into it. Um, so before we continue, um, I do put out a spoiler warning. Uh, for anyone expecting to play this campaign, I will be going over major story elements, and I will be going over um, a lot of the settings and whatnot. It's only like a one to two shot adventure, so I promise you I cannot talk about it without spoiling. Um, if you want to check out uh, just my overall general review, the score that I give it at the end of the video. You can go ahead and skip to that now, but that is your spoiler warning. Alrighty, so we jump into this. Uh, and we have a quick rundown of the entire adventure right here on this page. Now, a lot of D&D uh, &D adventures do a quick summary. In fact, I could even probably find the one in Lost Mind of Delvey, that isn't much longer than this, but that tends to be a very general summary of like what's going on, not the actual whole story. So for example, in Lost Minds of Fandelver, it might tell you who the bad guy is. It might tell you what, what he's doing, why he's doing it, but it doesn't go into detail about like where the players are gonna go, why they're gonna go there, how they're gonna get there, that sort of thing. In this just one page in a fairly large font uh, and one column, it goes over basically all of that, um, just to show how very uh, simple this, uh, this adventure is. Uh, and as I stated earlier, one of the issues I do have with it is that this entire starter set to get people introduced to D&D, &D, a campaign-driven RPG, right? I mean, if anyone has watched Critical Role or um, Dimension 20, anything like that, you know that these things last 1950. 50, 100 episodes in. I mean, these, these things, this is a game, I, I'm getting a little caught up on my words, this is a game based around playing long, drawn-out campaigns. Is there a, you know, room for one-shots and a lot of, uh, is there a following for that? Certainly, but I don't think that that style of, of adventure should be geared towards a starter set. Uh, maybe its own separate product line of D and D one shot adventures. Uh, but anyways, it the the campaign starts out, and you will be with um, audience with this royal man. I don't know exactly if he's a king or not, uh, but you're in a throne room, so he's very close to it. If not uh, of this village, his name is Sir Tristan, and basically his guards have been having trouble finding this monster that's been ravaging the town, which, no surprise, is the Thessal Hydra. Now, he doesn't want to send his guards away from the castle, so he sends the characters. Very simple plot hook. Um, like I said, the downside to it is its simplicity, but the upside is also its simplicity, as this is a starter set. 
Um, other than that, it's a little on the short side, like I said. Um, your characters will then try to track the Thessal Hydra, where they'll run into a few role-playing opportunities, and these I do actually enjoy. Um, they don't give you much here. Uh, just a few rumors on the road. You run into a merchant, you run into a priest, you run into a woodcutter, you run into an elderly farmer. Uh, in my campaign, I think, or in my adventure of it, I think I added in like an apple boy who is just selling apples or something like that. Uh, it's very dependent on the DM to flesh these things out and create that roleplay opportunity. Um, I do believe that it says to do that in here, but it doesn't have a ton of tips or guides on how to do that. So if you're truly new to this and don't have like inspiration to do it, it's going to be very difficult for you. It's going to be something that you, you, you as a DM might struggle with um, to, to truly make that a good, unique experience. But if you can, and if you're willing to, it's solid and it's there. So props to it for that. After you do that, eventually you'll find your way um, tracking this thing to the Troglodyte Caverns. And let me tell you, one of the biggest problems with this campaign is the Troglodyte Caverns. It is a bunch of caverns filled with nothing but troglodytes. Okay, now that's a little exaggerated. Um, I'm playing a little hyperbole here, but there's a lot of troglodytes. Uh, if I add it up in total, in total, I mean, I, I just glanced down and one room has 10 troglodytes in it. Now, I don't know right off the bat what troglodytes are, um, their challenge rating are. I don't know if they're one fourth or one half. But either way, troglodytes should not be one-fourth if they are. And if they're one-half, that's a CR5 encounter. Your players at level three are not ready for that. So not only are these troglodytes hard, if the DM doesn't know that ahead of time, he might play them to the best of his ability and completely TPK the party on their first ever D&D combat encounter. That is not something that you want. Uh, you know, personally, if I was playing D&D for the first time, I was excited, I got a character build going, I've named my character finally for the first time, and phew, the first radiant troglodyte claw creature that smells bad ends up killing me. I mean, that's kind of reminiscent of first edition, right? Where you build your character and a uh, gust of wind takes out your magic user. Uh, but all jokes aside... Um, there may only be two or three rooms that actually have chocolate. Oh, yeah, and there's an owlbear room in here. An owlbear. There's an owlbear, a giant frog, like 15 different troglodytes. That's too many troglodytes. There, there's just, there's too many trogs, period. That, nothing more has to be said about it. If there were less trogs, it would be way more enjoyable because that's just a bogged down combat encounter, especially without like mega area of effect spells. I do believe the wizard has flaming sphere, but the wizard does not have fireball or anything like that yet. Those are level three spells, so it doesn't get it to level five. So those 10 troglodytes are a serious problem for them to be dealing with. Um, so eventually there are a few good things there. There's like a false treasure room, which is kind of, kind of unique. Um, it's just kind of things that you would expect. There's a trap. Um, there's a shrine that the troglodytes are worshiping at. Uh, very basic looking map here, by the way. Um, and if you are, that's what the map looks like. Uh, once again, fitting the aesthetic of, I think it's supposed to be, yeah, it's supposed to be taped into his little notebook here. Um, keep in mind, if you are using a battle mat, it is gridded at 10 feet per square. So you've got to keep that in mind. Those are going to be four squares when you, when you actually use it on your battle mat. But... Anyways, eventually they'll make their way to the Cursed Labyrinth, which is one of the things I do actually enjoy about this adventure. Uh, the Cursed Labyrinth is a random path sort of maze where it's kind of randomly generated based on what the DM rolls every time. Uh, it's a very interesting puzzle, if you will, that the players get to encounter that the DM doesn't have to come up with. Excuse me, I'll have to fix my hoodie a little bit here. That the DM doesn't have to come up with beforehand it gives him the table if you will if y'all want to look at that gives him the table to roll on and then the maze is just generated and it basically says have fun with this do what you want add doors add secret doors whatever until you think you're ready to move on 
Uh, and in this random pathway, there are more encounters that you're supposed to have, uh, which include troglodytes. Like, stop with the troglodytes. I know that it's random, so they might not encounter them, but if they do, you just don't. Just cut out the troglodytes. It's not worth it. There's, there's more later on, I'm pretty sure, so just cut them out now. Um, but eventually, they will run into the Lost Knight. Probably my favorite part about this. There's a riddle based on... Actually, there's... Excuse me. There's three riddles um, that it goes through. And I'm not going to spoil it too much and go over too long. The video is already dragging on a bit more than I expected. Um, but the riddles are... They're good. They're interesting. Um, they intrigue the party, and me as a DM didn't actually know all of them at first when I was reading it through. So I know for sure, as a player, I would be very confused and have to consult each other. Uh, and I can tell you firsthand, having ran this, that it was very interesting seeing my players put pieces in, of the puzzle together, and possibly even put some pieces in the wrong place, which later came back to bite them in the uh, form of some electrocution. But <laughs> they are some very interesting riddles. Uh, and it is an incredible RP moment. There's not really, you know, combat. Damage can be dealt uh, if they get the riddles wrong. Uh, but other than that, it's a very puzzle environment and RP heavy moment uh, with the knight there kind of alluding to the answer at the DM's discretion, which is great. Um, and it is overall just the highlight of the campaign here. I really love this part. Um, but once you solve all the knight's riddles, you will finally make your way to the Upside Down. The players eventually find out that this is how the Thessal Hydra escapes. He makes his way into this universe called the Upside Down. Now, bear with me, I don't know my Stranger Things stuff, so I don't know if this is an alternate dimension, if it's just kind of like a hybrid dimension, a breach in the, you know, corporeal world. I don't know, okay? I don't know if this is the ethereal plane. Um... But the Upside Down is, if you remember, the three pillars of D&D, if you've, if you've looked into it at all. They are combat, exploration, and role-playing. The Upside Down is where exploration and setting is supposed to shine through in this module. Um, and my, as my notes say, that it is, it's very interesting exploration because the way it's laid out, it's, you're supposed to take the players on the exact same path that they went through um, when they first were trying to find Troglodyte Cavern, but show how it's been corrupted and changed and, you know, just filled with evil and dilapidated and molded and all that good stuff. But it doesn't have that here for you to do. It just says do it. So it is an extremely good exploration segment at the DM's discretion and at your DM's capability. Uh, so DMs, if you're watching this, take the time to read that. Take the time to write that out. You know, if you're doing this in multiple uh, sessions, like I said, it can be a one shot. I've played it both ways. I've played it as a one shot and as like a two and a half shot. Um, if you're playing it as more than one shot, remember, write down the path you took them through so you can do it the same exact way and show all that dilapidation and that, that fear that your players should have. Um, so now we get to one of the swords uh, and one of the big problems with this campaign. It's a sword that Sir Tristan gives your players. It's called the Winter's Dark Bite. Uh, and while it's in the Upside Down, this sword acts as a plus four greatsword. Uh, now, if you know anything about D&D, plus one greatswords or plus one anything, pretty uncommon. They're nice. They're quality. Plus two, you're getting up there. You know, plus three, we're talking some pretty legendary stuff. There's not many plus fours out there. And just handing this to a level three uh, player, that's a big deal. This is, this is really going to set expectations, if this is their primary magic item, a little too high. Um, if I were you, I'd bump it down. I think the Thessal Hydra and the Demogorgon, which are both coming up, can both be beaten uh, with some smart players and some decent combat tactics without this being so incredibly powerful. Um, so that is another flaw of the campaign. I do think that that magic item, other than that, you get some potions of healing. I think there's a wand of magic missiles in there somewhere. Um, all of those are pretty standard magic items and don't set the bar too high, but a plus four greatsword is just a little too far. Um, but besides that, you continue through the upside down. 
like I said, some interesting exploration. The solid, the, the second half, basically once you hit the night, is where things take off. It's just that troglodyte cavern that really bogs down the campaign. So if you can just speed that up, get them into the lost maze or the lost labyrinth, whatever I called it, um, get them to that lost night and forward, things get a little bit more interesting. Um, so in the Upside Down, they're going to encounter an NPC called the Proud Princess. Um, I think this is supposed to represent Eleven, but like I said, don't slaughter me in the comments if I got my Stranger Things stuff wrong. Um, but she is, of course, a very useful NPC. She's a very powerful NPC that can help them fight the Demogorgon when that fight comes up, and she even warns them of the Demogorgon. Uh, and basically tells them, yes, I can help you track this Thessal Hydra, but we need the blood of the Demogorgon. And so that's exactly what the players do. They go, they seek out a Demogorgon, they fight a Demogorgon, which is a really interesting combat. I always love it when a campaign makes tailor-made monsters for that campaign. And the Demogorgon and Thessal Hydra are no different. They're really creative, they're really useful. And like I said before, in case you didn't hear it, spoilers ahead, um, the, the Demogorgon has a very... Uh, special trait very similar to trolls in D&D how it will keep coming back from zero hit points unless it's been dealt fire damage or acid damage I believe uh, and if your players don't know that going ahead of time which they shouldn't it's very interesting to watch them just freak out as this thing just keeps getting back up and dishing damage at them until they desperately try to find out you know what it is that's going to stop it from from doing that. Um, and so they kill, they, they slay the Demogorgon, like I said, very good combat there in the Demogorgon, and great NPC in the Proud Princess. Um, they finally make their way out of the Upside Down, and admittingly, the Great Sword goes to like a plus two, which is a bit more acceptable. It's just that plus four was a little too far. Um, and they end up straight into the final dungeon, which is only about seven rooms. It's, it's very simple. You, you encounter a few different creatures. That was a Demogorgon, by the way. Um, you encounter a few different creatures on your way. Uh, once again, this map is 10 feet, just in case uh, you guys are planning to run it. Uh, but you encounter a few different creatures. You encounter some giant spiders. If you choose to fight that, my players personally didn't. Uh, they, they managed to be perceptive enough to see all the webs in there and were like, no, thank you. Uh, <laughs> but there is a little bit of monster variety in there. Uh, there is once again another room of tin troglodytes. Just cut it out. Um, or you can keep it, but don't make it a combat. So try, try to find a way to, to RP this if you're really dead set on running this adventure. Um, there's even an ochre jelly in there at some point, but of course the highlight of this is the Thessal Hydra, um, which is, uh, for all intents and purposes, a... a difficult monster, a dangerous monster. I was quickly going to look and see if I have the monster stat block here to go ahead and check its CR real quick. Um, troglodytes, by the way, one-fourth. That's real low for troglodytes. They have a multi-attack right there. Uh, but yeah, if I go ahead and check the Thessal Hydra here, we're looking at a CR4. Um, so for level three PCs, it's a challenge. It's not just going to be an easy fight. Uh, and it, of course, it has a recharge attack with its big acid ball breath thing. Uh, and if it happens to get lucky on those recharges, it can turn into a deadly fight quickly. Uh, I know in my personal campaign through this, or run, adventure, whatever you want to call it, I did have a lot of PCs die. It was not a TPK. Our paladin came out gloriously successful, uh, but the rest of them did not do so well. Uh, and it was almost a desperate slug fest to get out of there alive they might have killed the thessal hydra but there were still the spiders and the trogs and the. Uh, but of course like i said i tried to turn those into more rp because they'd fought enough trogs at this point they'd fought like 15 uh, they were getting tired of stench and multi-attack you know so um all in all my final uh, thoughts on the campaign here or on the uh, adventure i keep calling it a campaign because that's what i'm used to for dnd but this is definitely much more of an adventure it, it lasts, as, as stated already, one to two different sessions, most likely. You can squeeze three out of it, like my group did that one time. But our third session was purely the Thessal Hydra fight. It was about 30 minutes, so it wasn't really a third session. Um, the second half of it, if you get through the Troglodyte Caverns, is not a bad adventure. Um, it's not a great adventure, or even a good one, in my opinion. Uh, but it is not a bad adventure. It's just a little lackluster and a little short uh, and quick to the point for a starter set. I don't think this introduces enough of D&D's elements. Um, 
And then the last kind of thing is that there's not a ton of replayability. And what I mean is not replaying the game, or maybe I should say extendability. Um, sure, you could replay the, the adventure, but uh, unless you have a different group of players or mostly a different group of players, a different DM, something like that, um, overall, it's probably going to be kind of boring because at the end of the day, you've already done that adventure. What I mean by extendability or replayability is that most of these starter sets, as I said earlier, include extra monsters, include extra magic items, include extra little details about elements of the world that you can expand upon as a DM through your own writing and homebrew content to continue making adventures going forward with just this stuff. Um, and unfortunately, that's not very present in here. Uh, there's a good deal of monsters that are present here. And I think that that definitely adds a nice aspect to it. I'm just trying to get the, the character sheets out for one final point here. Okay, that's what I thought. Um, and the character sheets do include rules for leveling up from three to five. But you don't level up to fourth level until you've killed the Thessal Hydra, until you're done with the whole adventure, and then there's no reason to level up, because there's nothing here to keep you playing this kit. You know, I can use some of the stuff in this original starter set. There's more stat blocks. There's a lot of places to explore that I could expand upon. There's just not that here. Um, it doesn't go in depth enough. And a lot of that draws right back to the fact that if you put it in regular D&D format, this is like a six to seven page adventure. This is nothing crazy, nothing that long, uh, very straight to the point. And it just doesn't leave the loopholes and maybe not quite the right word, but the, the guiding paths there for a DM to just shoot off and take it to their own direction and take it up to level five. Sure, that won't take too long. It's probably another two or three shot to get to level five, but you just don't really have the means to do so. All right, and so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and get into my final overall review of it. I split it into three categories, technically. I've got a ranking for the physical items, ranking for the adventure, and then a, an overall ranking combining the two. Um, physically, the box art was nice, uh, and other than that, the minis were lackluster. It's nice that they included an unpainted one, but its quality and bendability is a little on the on the trash side, if I'm just being honest there. Uh, the dice set, while not terrible, is lacking in the quantity department, uh, which I mean, it would just prove difficult to try to play the whole table with that one dice set. You only have one d20 for the whole table, I mean, you're going to be passing dice like crazy. Um, so overall, you know, it has its shortcomings. It has a few things going for it. I gave it a very average score of 5 out of 10. Um, the adventure is very similar. It's got things going for it. It's got cool riddles. It's got decent combat in the Demogorgon and the Thessal Hydra, but it has a lot of drawbacks in just too many fights with Trogs, overbearing, elongated combat with Trogs. Um, I don't want to say bland exploration, but it's lacking the depth that makes it interesting unless your DM adds it. And you can't expect a DM to know what they're doing in a starter set, you need to lay that out for them. Tell them, you know, this is how you go about this. And then later on, let them try to do it on their own in that expandability. But there's just not that. Uh, so unless you already have that creative, you know, mind going and you're, you're adding things and you're making it your own, which is exactly what you should be doing, then I applaud you for doing so. But if you're not already doing that, it's just lacking in its overall content and immersion that it just seems very straightforward. Seven page, we had to write an adventure, we're, we're selling this for the, the Stranger Things theme, put it out there. So at that, with its flaws and with its, you know, pros, uh, it also comes out to a five out of ten. With a caveat of, I believe this bumps it up to about a seven out of ten if you are a Die hard Stranger Things fan. But just because someone is a die hard Stranger Things fan, I do not think you should try to use this set to get them into DD. 
If they are showing any sort of interest into D&D, try to get them to play the Essentials Kit. Try to get them to play the Starter Set or something that you personally are DMing or running or that a friend of yours is running that you know is quality, elongated, and immersive. Um, so with that, the overall average for the Starter Set, for the Stranger Things Starter Set, let me get it all boxed back up for you guys here in just a moment, but the overall score that I gave the Stranger Things starter set uh -huh. is indeed a 5 out of 10. And if you count the little bit of boosted uh, 7 out of 10 for Stranger Things fan, it puts the overall product at a 6 out of 10. Thank you all for watching. I know it's a little bit of a longer video and I haven't done this style of video before, so let me know what you guys think of it. Uh, if there's anything else you guys want to see me review, whether it be D&D &D or something else. And of course, I hope you guys have a great day.